and people are uh, going to be trickling in. I want to thank you for being here. I'm Mike Van Dusen, Executive Vice President of the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, welcome. Uh, you know that we are the official national memorial, public-private institution, official national memorial of the 28th president. And we're delighted to, to uh, have this uh, book launch here today. Uh, Senator Moynihan, for those of you who don't know, it had more to do with this institution than any other individual um, going back to uh, the 1960s. And uh, he spent several years in residence as a senior scholar after he retired from the United States Senate and did a good bit of writing here. Uh, we're delighted to, to put on uh, this event. Um, uh, Gil Troy has uh, spent the last 20 years or so in Montreal, and um, he, he has written this book, and uh, we're happy to, to have him here. He will present it. Uh, he'll be followed by a panel that will include uh, Stephen Hess, who's a uh, senior fellow emeritus, I believe, from the Brookings Institution, uh, Maura uh, Moynihan, who uh, is the senator's daughter and an author in her own right, uh, and uh, Steve Weissman, who uh, uh, I believe uh, met uh, Senator Moynihan in India uh, when they were both serving there a few years ago. Steve, uh, Stephen is, uh, Weissman is now over at the uh, Peterson Institute, I guess, um, uh, for International Economics. He's an editorial assistant and research fellow. Uh, Sam Wells, a senior scholar at the center and indeed institutional memory in this institution, and uh, um, will be moderating. Uh, Sam is working on a book on the origins of the Korean War. Thank you all for being here, and uh, we look forward to uh, Gil's remarks, and then to hearing from the panel. Gil, mm -hmm. you can be there or here. I'll be here. Well, let me add a word of welcome as well. It's a special pleasure to chair this meeting, which is the first of what will be a series of lectures, we hope, on uh, themes that were important to Senator Moynihan. Um, all of you, those of you who had the privilege of knowing him and working with him, would appreciate what a larger-than-life force he was. And certainly in the life of this center, he was uh, instrumental in its creation and ultimately in its survival, and then spent uh, what were unfortunately his last years here uh, before his untimely death. But uh, we enjoyed having frequent interaction with him, and uh, there was never a dull moment when he was present in a meeting. So let me introduce Gil Troy, our speaker, our initial speaker, and then I'll introduce the commentators and panelists uh, before they appear. Gil Troy is professor of history at McGill University and has been for a number of years among one of McLean Magazine's most popular profs listings. He's the author of eight books, including See How They Ran, The Changing Role of Presidential Candidates, Mr. and Mrs. President, From the Trumans to the Clintons, Hillary Clinton, Polarizing First Lady, and Why Moderates Make the Best Presidents, George Washington to Barack Obama. The Moynihan's Moment, today's book of choice, is uh, his latest volume. He's published widely in the American, Canadian, and Israeli media. He writes a weekly column for the Jerusalem Post and uh, is a research fellow on the Engaging Israel team at the Shalom Hartman Center in Jerusalem. There are numerous other accolades that I could mention, but he uh, is very nice to come to us and to present his book today, and we look forward, Gil, to what you have to say. Thank you. Wow. What a privilege it is to speak about Daniel Patrick Moynihan in the center that he so loved, on this avenue, Pennsylvania Avenue, that he worked so hard to beautify. And what an honor it is to share this podium with Steve Hess. I remember reading your works when I was a little kid and saying, wow, what an extraordinary career this guy has had. What an extraordinary career this guy has had, and I wish I could somehow uh, replicate it. And I don't think I've replicated it, but to share a panel with you is a great honor. Steve Weissman, the work you've done in putting together the Moynihan letters uh, made my work so much easier and made me look so much smarter, smarter so I thank you. And Maura, um, 
I got an email from more the day the book came out, and it said, Professor Troy, please call me. And ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, oh no, am I gonna be uh, called on the carpet or embraced? And you've become uh, a old new friend or new old friend. It's really a pleasure to be with you. And I thank all of you for taking your time. And I know many of you are old Moynihan hands who could, far, could tell me a lot more about Moynihan than I could tell you. But he really was an extraordinary person, and we're actually celebrating the 10th anniversary of his death. Um, and marking that extraordinary legacy that he left. The fact that when we talk about the gun control debate today, Moynihan said, guns don't kill people, bullets kill people, and wanted to limit ammunition. Um, when we talk about the complexities of ethnic and tribal conflict throughout the world, it was Moynihan who warned about this years ago, and I remember uh, as a freshman at Harvard learning that modernization theory taught us that we were all going to evolve away from our tribal and ethnic affiliations. Uh, but even then, Moynihan was saying no. Uh, we certainly live in an age now where there's no more Soviet Union, and Moynihan was one of those few rare voices who was considered to be a lunatic, uh, like Margaret Thatcher, like Ronald Reagan, like Pope John Paul, who thought that the Soviet Union uh, would not last forever. So it's, it's really uh, amazing to see, even today, how much his ideas and vision continues to shape public debate. And it's not that he was a soothsayer. He was a social scientist. And he believed and he showed that by using social science, you could not predict the future, but you could anticipate trends. And you could be ahead of the curve. And of course, as this extraordinary scholar statesman, uh, the Woodrow Wilson of the late 20th century, uh, he, George Will Quipped, wrote more books as senator than most senators had read. And often let them know that, but uh, also had a certain kind of uh, ability to uh, keep that civility. And that's why I call it Moynihan's Moment Extended, because I'm focusing on 1975, uh, November 1975, when Moynihan stood up at a critical moment in American history and in Jewish history. But the moment is extended because uh, we have so much to learn from him today. But let's go back to 1975. And as an American historian, I started this intellectual journey by looking at the fall of South Vietnam, a low point in American history, a moment when America really thought that it had lost its way, lost its soul. And it's the 1970s. It's the time of soaring crime, of this new phenomenon called stagflation, a stagnant economy and yet inflation. Richard Nixon becomes the first president in American history to resign and is replaced by Gerald Ford. New York City the city where Moynihan had grown up is teetering on the brink. And in fact, in late October, early November 1975, Gerald Ford will say, I'm not going to bail out this bankrupt city, and we'll have the famous headline, Ford to City Drop Dead. And New York City itself seems to be this kind of late 20th century vision of hell, uh, urban decay. And when Moynihan gets up and defends Israel. He's defending democracy. He's defending decency. He's defending civility. And he's also fighting for his political life. Now, there are two critical moments I want to focus on. November 10th, 1975, is when Moynihan will give his famous, famous speech saying, the United States rises to declare before the General Assembly that it does not acknowledge, it will not abide by, it will never acquiesce in this infamous act. And he actually waited until the resolution passed because his confrontational approach had been seen, deemed so undiplomatic, so problematic that he didn't want people saying that the reason why the resolution passed was because of the speech he'd given. And so he only gave the speech after the resolution passed. But three weeks earlier, the resolution had first come before the Human Rights Committee, the third committee of the UN. And on that day, Moynihan didn't speak. Leonard Garment, representing the US to the Human Rights Committee, spoke and he called the resolution obscene. Garment's a trial lawyer and he had spent time trying to figure out what was the right word to convey his disdain, his disgust. And obscenity seemed to be the right word because it sullies us all. And that was his fear. He was fighting for the life of the United Nations, for the standards of the United Nations, for the standards of human rights. The Israeli ambassador to the UN, Chaim Herzog, gets up and speaks and he says, we're not on trial today. The Jewish people are not on trial today. 
The UN is on trial today. Will the UN stand by its ideals? And of course, despite their eloquence, the inevitable happens. The resolution is passing to be passed on to the General Assembly. And after the vote, the delegates break out in mock applause, mocking Israel, mocking the Jewish people, mocking, in a sense, the ideals of the UN itself. Herzog had given his delegates strict orders not to show any emotion. And so the Israeli delegation sits there quietly, stone-faced. But from across the room, a six-foot-five Irish Catholic U.S. ambassador to the U.N. stands up, straightens his tie, walks across the room, hugs Chaim Herzog, and very loudly says, fuck him. <laughs> That's a quote. I apologize. <laughs> He would later, in telling the story, say, I uttered an Anglo-Saxonism not found in the Talmud. And the New York Times would simply say that Moynihan embraced Herzog. And in that embrace, Moynihan was saying, we stand for core ideals. We're not humiliated. We haven't fallen despite the challenges of the 1970s. But that moment, and three weeks later, when he gave that speech on November 10th, 1975, Moynihan felt very alone. He felt very alone because the universe that was important to him, starting with his nominal boss at the time, Henry Kissinger, was undermining him. On that day, November 10th, 1975, that Moynihan spoke, Kissinger, in a telephone conversation which was transcribed, says to one of his aides, we're, conduct we're conducting foreign policy here. This isn't a synagogue. And then the first Jewish Secretary of State jokes about whether this Irish Catholic ambassador is going to convert. Kissinger, again, of course, was against the resolution. But he was also against Moynihan's confrontational approach to diplomacy, and also didn't like all the attention that Moynihan was getting, because we have two Harvard egos here battling it out. And it's a great story of the two of them fighting it out. In the delegate lounge, of course, Moynihan was also rather unpopular. He's too confrontational. He's too controversial. He's making too much trouble. You see this picture here, which was a gift from Maura when we first met. It's one of her favorite pictures of her father. And you see Henry Kissinger, expansive, welcoming the Secretary General, Kurt Waldheim. And Kurt Waldheim uh, is sitting there, and Moynihan looks like he wants to be anywhere but <laughs> on that couch. Kissinger, of course, had lost 19 relatives in the Holocaust. And Waldheim, at the time, probably was being blackmailed by the KGB, the Russian Secret Service, uh, because they knew what we would ultimately discover 10 years later, that uh, Waldheim had been uh, a Nazi and had been involved in uh, atrocities. Um, and of course, I, I leads to that joke that my brother Tevi reminded me of uh, today, which is, uh, you know, there's Alzheimer's, and then there's Waldheimer's disease, which is when you forget you were a Nazi. Um, <laughs> and, but that was the UN. And then, of course, in the universe beyond the UN, when he reads the New York Times, the holy New York Times, which every New York intellectual lives and dies by, he's, again, the New York Times isn't against his voting against the resolution, but is against his approach to diplomacy and his Harvard colleagues. And so he's feeling very much alone. And part of Moynihan's moment is understanding the heroism, the courage that it took to stand up and say, this is not the American way. We have to have a new approach to diplomacy. But the other part of Moynihan's moment is that when he did speak so powerfully, so eloquently, so passionately, the American people responded. And the next day, over 125,000 Americans massed in downtown New York. The Jewish community itself, which organized the rally, wasn't sure what the reaction would be. And so they called it a youth rally. Because for a youth rally to be deemed successful, you only need 100,000. <laughs> oh, you only need 10,000. And here you had 125,000 showing up. And speaker after speaker, denounced the resolution. Betty Friedan, fresh from the Mexico City conference, which had been actually the first international forum to declare Zionism racism, who had, had no deep connection to Judaism or Zionism before, has an aha moment in Mexico City and realizes the hostility against her as an American, as a Jew, is such that he has to stand up and she joins this rally and declares herself a Zionist for the first time. And people had buttons saying, I am a Zionist. And in that crowd were people from the left and from the right, blacks and whites, joining together and saying, this is not the American way, and calling it an anti-Semitic resolution. 
and among the three African-American speakers that day was Bayard Rustin, Martin Luther King's loyal lieutenant, who was known as Mr. March because he helped organize the 1963 march in Washington when Martin Luther King had said, I had a dream. And Rustin had organized a series of protests and advertisements. He organized a group called Basic Black Americans to Support Israel Committee with over 200 leading African Americans, including Hank Aaron, the home run king, and Roy Campanella of the Brooklyn Dodgers, and Coretta Scott King and Daddy King signing, saying this is not the way, this is not acceptable. 28 leading African American intellectuals had signed a letter to the New York Times saying that if this Zionism is racism resolution, seeing out one form of nationalism, that form of nationalism, Jewish nationalism, to be racist, is using that word and demeaning that word, and then it's part of a connection to try to compare Israel to apartheid. It demeans our struggle against apartheid. Words matter. And so Bayard Rustin gets up, and he says, they're hijacking our language. If we use the word racism to mean every SOB on the international scene, it loses its meaning. It's losing its potency. It loses its power. And then so moved by the crowd, Rustin looks out and sings. When Israel was in Egypt's land, and 125,000 people sing, let my people go. <laughs> and that, too, was Moynihan's moment. And Moynihan becomes a pop star. A week later, on NBC's Saturday Night, the program that very shortly thereafter would be renamed Saturday Night Live, Chevy Chase is doing his comic routine of the nightly newscast. So first, he mimics Gerald Ford. Uh, in this particular case, he didn't uh, fumble with the phone, but he drank water and poured it through his ear. <laughs> and then he says, this week, the United Nations General Assembly declared Zionism to be a form of racism. Sammy Davis Jr., the African-American singer who just recently converted to Judaism, said, at last, a breakthrough. I can hate myself. <laughs> Moynihan ends up on the cover of Time magazine. And perhaps even more important, he ends up designated one of the 25 most intriguing people of 1975, up there with Cher, Woody Allen, Betty Ford, and Warner Earhart of Est, just to bring us back <laughs> to the 1970s. And as a result of that moment, he loses one job and gains another. Within months, Henry Kissinger's machinations have worked, and Moynihan is out as US ambassador to the UN. And Moynihan only lasts in that job eight months but changes history. And then, in what could be a whole other book, Moynihan runs for the Senate with this colorful cast of characters, Paul O'Dwyer, Abe Hirschfeld, the parking lot magnate who had fought for the Irgun, uh, Ramsey Clark, the <laughs> former uh, Attorney General under uh, Lyndon Johnson, and of course, Bella Abzug, and wins just by a, a few thousand votes, and goes on to become the senator that so many of you worked with and served so loyally and effectively four terms representing New York in the Senate. And of course, Moynihan fights for the next 16 years to get the Zionism racism re resolution repealed. And indeed, it is repealed. I want to end by giving just a few takeaways, a few conclusions. One is what we see in this story of Moynihan's moment is that the ties between the United States and Israel are not artificial astroturf but they're deep, organic, enduring. They're about common values. It's an extraordinary moment in American history, an extraordinary moment in Jewish history, when the people of the superpower, not just the leaders of the superpower, stand up and denounce an act of anti-Semitism. This is truly a healing moment after the horrors of the Holocaust. And we also see how toxic the whole delegitimization of Israel is. Moynihan's moment is not about boundaries, and it's not about settlements, and it's not about the rights and wrongs of particular Israeli policies. It's about what Moynihan called a big red lie, a Soviet-engineered in lie that continues to this day, that should unite left and right in a fight for truth, and should unite people who want to make sure that there's room for peace talks. Because how can you expect there to be any kind of discussion of peace, any kind of progress, when Palestinians believe that the Israelis are racists, or the Israelis feel that they're constantly being called racist. And so we learn from Moynihan's moment that delegitimization itself is toxic and an obstacle to peace. We learn also that Moynihan, and this is the phrase that he used, the slogan that he used in running for 
Senate in 1976, believed that this is a society worth defending. He wanted to stop America from constantly apologizing for itself. And he sees himself as fighting for the left, fighting for liberalism. He thinks that liberalism needs protection both from conservatives, and he'll remain a true blue liberal throughout the Reagan years and to his death. He sees, of course, in the traditional tension between liberty and equality, that he, tends, he and his friends tend toward liberty. He fears the totalitarianism that results sometimes for the push and the, uh, and the emphasis too much on equality. He believes that culture counts, but if you look at this quotation, he still believes that the great idea at the heart of the Democratic Party is that government can be the instrument to the common purpose of a free people, that government can embrace great causes and do great things. And he didn't like the term neoconservative. First of all, he knew it was a term coined an epithet, that Michael Harrington had used it um, to dismiss uh, Moynihan and his gang. But more than that, Moynihan would write a letter, which is in your collection, to punch Sulzberger of the New York Times and say, every time one of your reporters wants to call me a neoconservative, please have them cross it out and write a liberal patriot or a liberal who believes in spending some money on the defense budget. <laughs> Moynihan was fighting totalitarianism. Moynihan feared the totalitarianism of the, United, of, of, the, of the Soviet Union, the totalitarianism of the Chinese would undermine the United States. And totalitarianism is not only about sacrificing individuals in the service of your cause, but sacrificing truth in the service of your cause. And so he said that Resolution 3379, this resolution declaring Zionism and racism, reeked of the totalitarian mind, stank of the totalitarian state. And he said in here in this cartoon, and I want to thank Maura for giving me these wonderful cartoons, they say, what do you call a six foot five inch angry Irishman? And the answer, of course, is sir. <laughs> um, and he said, people think that because the United States is attacked so much that we're in trouble. But no, we're assailed because of what is right about us. We're assailed because we are a democracy. And he feared that terrible lie, the terrible lie that Zionism is somehow racism was going to pervert all kinds of terms, was going to make the United Nations open to all kinds of lies. And he was trying to teach Henry Kissinger and the State Department and other people in the West that the United States was now in opposition, that the, things, that the world had changed. The United Nations was turning into the Third World Dictators Debating Society. And you had to master the new rules. And you had to fight for what was right, even if it was deemed to be undiplomatic. That had to be a new kind of diplomacy. And he was part of an enduring fight. The conflict between Kissinger and Moynihan is an enduring fight between idealists and realists. What do we do with our foreign policy? Do we base it on our ideals? Or do we base it on a realistic assessment of situation? And obviously, there has to be a mix of both. And in his second inaugural address, Barack Obama talked about a foreign policy based on values and conscience and based on our interests. But it's a perennial fight, and Moynihan was certainly fighting that. Domestically, and there are only two more. Domestically, he brings in a new approach, what I call the politics of patriotic indignation. And he anticipates the constructive anger that you see in someone like Ed Koch. And the constructive anger that you see in the network movie 1976, which I believe Moynihan's moment inspired, because Patty Jeffsky was, was a screenwriter, where Peter Finch gets up and says, I'm mad as hell, I'm not going to take this anymore. And when Moynihan was told to tone down, he said, what is this phrase, toning down? How do you tone down your outrage at a lie? You say it's only a half-truth? Who do they think we are? Mm -hmm. What do they think we've become? And of course, the politics of patriotic indignation in the 1970s inspires Ronald Reagan's Morning in America. And the patriotic resurgence of the 1980s is rooted in the trauma of the 1970s. And finally, Moynihan's eternal message. Individuals count. Words matter. He said that his journey from the North River to the East River, which is longshoreman talk for the Hudson River, took many turns. But he believed that you had to stand for ideas and you have to stand for ideals. And in his final public appearance, when after long and complicated relationship with Harvard. He finally got a Harvard degree and was a Harvard commencement speaker. After 9-11, he said, civilization need not die. He remained an optimist. But only the United States can save it. We have to understand there is good and evil in the world. But we also have to approach it with the generosity of the Marshall Plan. And perhaps his epitaph, during the big fight with Kissinger in 1975, Moynihan sent a telegram. And in the telegram, he said, an issue of honor of morality was put before us, and not all of us ran, with that little edge that Moynihan sometimes had. And indeed, he was one who didn't run. He was one who stood up. And because of the heroic way he stood up, 
the American people stood up with him and cheered and showed that they too stand for principles. Thank you very much. Let me introduce our two commentators. First, Stephen Hess, who's one of the country's foremost authorities on media and government, a senior fellow emeritus at the Government Studies Program at Brookings, where he joined first in 1972. He's also taught at George Washington University, and he, perhaps most importantly, served on the staff of Presidents Dwight Eisenhower and Richard Nixon and as, as an advisor to President Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter. Uh, Dr. Hess has served as a fellow of faculty in the Faculty of Government at Harvard as U.S. Representative to the U.N. General Assembly and the UNESCO General Conference. He uh, has been an authority on media and government participation. He's been involved in many U.S. cultural missions around the world. The author of numerous publications, including The Presidential Campaign, The Ultimate Insiders, U.S. Senators in the National Media, and The Washington Reporters. Uh, he also wrote Nixon, A Political Portrait with Earl Mazo, which has uh, now 30 foreign editions. Uh, our second commentator will be Stephen Weissman, who's Editorial Director and Research Fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. He began at the Peterson Institute 2008. Prior to that, he had been the Chief Correspondent for International Economics with the New York Times. In a long career with the Times, he served as a member of the editorial board. He worked, his work has appeared in the Times Book Review, the magazine, various features and culture sections since 1968. Before serving as the chief international economics correspondent, he was the dip chief diplomatic correspondent and won the Edward Weintal Prize in 2004 for reporting on diplomacy and international affairs. He had earlier served as deputy foreign editor, and uh, during this period he, he wrote about the emergence of Japan and India's global economic powers, while serving as bureau chief for the Times in Tokyo and New Delhi. He was senior White House correspondent during the first term of Ronald Reagan, and his coverage of the New York City fiscal crisis later earned him the Silurian Society Award in 1975. Steve is the editor of, is the author of The Great Tax Wars, Lincoln to Wilson, The Fierce Battles Over Money and Power That Transformed the Nation, which won the Sidney Hillman Award in 2003. He's also the editor of a fine book of Moynihan Letters, which many of you have probably used here, uh, used in your work. He is currently working on a book tentatively entitled Moynihan and the Nixon White House. So, Stephen Hess. Thank you so much. Let's see, how are we doing? Is this on? It is. They're all on. They're all on. Okay. Uh, Gil Troy's superb uh, Moynihan moment is an opportunity to speculate on Pat's future in literature. <laughs> what will be the book on Moynihan? I once wrote that Pat seems to live in chapters, meant to be an observation, not a prediction. Pat had the most complicated, complex, multi-leveled, multi-layered career of any American public official of the 20th century, with the possible exception of William Howard Taft. He served on the state level uh, as an assistant to the governor, on the national level, first in the executive branch, uh, as a cabinet or sub-cabinet for four presidents, two Democrats, two Republicans, domestic, labor, White House, international, India, UN, capped by four terms, 24 years, as the United States Senator from New York, plus a constant stream of books, articles, and controversies. Uh, I've written that intellectuals stop being intellectuals once they are elected to office, <laughs> citing the careers of Henry Cabot Lodge Sr. and several academics who moved to the Senate. Not so Pat. Despite the demands of public office, but fortified by the re resources of being in public office, he actually became more prolific and, and more prolific and interesting writer. 
of books of his book writing before 1969, when Maximum Feasible Misunderstanding was published, and Pat became a White House advisor, he was essentially known for one book, uh, Beyond the Melting Pot, co-authored with Nathan Glazer. Post-1969, he published 10 books, including Loyalties, on Law of Nations, Secrecy, and two volumes of, mem of the memoir variety, the, public, uh, the Politics of a Guaranteed Income and a Dangerous Place with Suzanne uh, Weaver. Pat was destined to be written about an early biography by Douglas Schoen, a splendid collection of 13 essays put together by Robert Katzman uh, to commemorate his 70th birthday, which included the thoughts of Senate co colleague Bill, uh, Bill um, Bradley and his Harvard colleague James Q. Wilson, and a uh, insightful discussion by Tevi Troy in Intellectuals and the American Presidency. As for Moynihan in Chapters, in 2010, James Patterson wrote, Freedom is Not Enough, The Moynihan Report and America's Struggle Over the Black Family Life, a brilliant book of 264 pages about the consequences of a government report of 78 pages. Now comes Gil Troy's book of 357 pages about one speech and its consequences. Gil is a solid scholar and a lucid writer, but he has never written a book like this. It is the passion, the outrage, that distinguishes Moynihan's moment in Gill's corpus. He has simply found the right subject, which few writers are so lucky to have. Here's something that fascinates me. Gill writes that, the, that he only met, met Pat once, he was a teenager canvassing his neighborhood in Queens for Moynihan and shook the candidate's hand. The more I think about this, the more I recognize a great asset for Gill as a writer, not to have known Pat, <laughs> an irony worthy of Moynihan. Pat lit up the sky. For some people, the glare could be confusing, even blinding. Being too close to the light, the enveloping presence of Moynihan could warp one's sense of him one way or another. <laughs> I don't think the nearness worked well for Godfrey Hodgson, a massively good British journalist and a friend of Pat's, who wrote a Moynihan biography that fell short of cap capturing his friend, yet Godfrey was perfectly able to capture Woodrow Wilson's Colonel House in another book. <laughs> This happens to worry me a great deal at the moment because I'm now trying to write a little book about Moynihan and Nixon. I've written a lot of books, but I've never had as much trouble getting my sea legs. My effort could be thought of as another Moynihan chapter, but as a participant, I think of it in another cap category, uh, perhaps more like Chester Finn's Education and the Presidency, which is an account of another Moynihan staffer in the Nixon White House. After Patterson, Troy, perhaps Hess. Uh, there will be others who will be delving into aspects of Moynihan's career and ideas. Chairman of the Senate, Far of Senate Finance Committee, Moynihan and the Intelligence Committee, Moynihan and various pieces of legislation, Social Security, Environment, uh, the uh, uh, Surface Transportation, Moynihan as, as an architect critic. The Moynihan Collection at the Library of Congress is a gold mine. The papers, when stacked up, would be higher than the Washington Monument, <laughs> an index of 1,100 pages. Liz Moynihan tells me that the scholars are lining up. And of course, this is a great life and a great place to find a dissertation topic or the book one needs for tenure or possibly even a bestseller. Moreover, Steve Wiseman has provided the keys in pa and Daniel Patrick Moynihan, a portrait in letters of an American visionary. Only someone who knows this collection, as I do, can truly appreciate Steve's incredible undertaking and the magnificent outcome of his labors. So what's my forecast on where Moynihan places the book on Pat? There are, cont are contenders who are more powerful, but unlike Pat, they were not men of ideas and hence not as interesting subjects. So. Daniel Patrick Moynihan will be the most written about American public official of the 20th century who was not a president 
or a Secretary of State. Supreme Court justices I put aside and leave in another category for legal scholars. You see Pat's reaction to this. The white hair flops over his right eye. The eyebrows raise as high as eyebrows can go. There's that mischievous grin. Yeah, he will enjoy this. In the meantime, we read the chapters and wait for some future Robert Car Carroll to put it all together. Thank you. Thank you uh, to the Woodrow Wilson Center, to Mora, and to Gil for inviting me uh, to participate in this wonderful day. And thank you, Steve, for your very generous comments. I'd like to offer a few personal observations about this book. I loved it. And when Gil uh, came by a couple years ago, a year or two ago, to talk about it, I thought, what a brilliant idea uh, for a book, because it really was a moment that encapsulated its time, as uh, Gil just uh, explained so eloquently in his opening uh, remarks. Uh, it's been 10 years, uh, incredibly, since Pat uh, passed away. Just uh, a couple weeks ago uh, was the anniversary, or le uh, just a week ago. Uh, and Steve is right uh, that his reputation has not only not faded, it's grown. Two examples. Uh, just this winter, uh, the American Enterprise Institute issued this book by Nicholas Eberstadt about uh, th this being a society of takers, givers versus takers, uh, this whole entitlement debate with uh, that uh, 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 w raced through the presidential election last year, and Eberst and there in Eberstadt's book, which takes the conservative view that all these programs are creating dependency and everything, is the dedication to Daniel Patrick Moynihan as the father of uh, this idea, uh, which is now widely shared, in, but also widely disputed. And then just this week in The New Yorker is a beautiful essay by Rick Hertzberg. Uh, did you see it in the uh, notes and comment, talking about the use the, of the word entitlement and how it had been distorted, and who does he quote as arguing on the other side of that issue, but Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Uh, which really, uh, in both cases, they got it right. You know, he, Pat, was, um, you know, brought great insight into the tension in American politics over government. Uh, he embodied that tension. But Moynihan's moment here is more about uh, the international uh, uh, insights of Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And uh, I... I said, I, I just wanted to be a little bit personal here. When my uh, book, or the, the book I edited, came out a little more than two years ago, I was promoting it. In fact, I was privileged to give a talk here at the uh, Woodrow Wilson Center. And uh, at the time, I was also serving as the uh, member of the program committee at my synagogue uh, here in Washington. and. Uh, we were, uh, the rabbi wanted uh, me to help come up with ideas of speakers to talk about their books. And I said, well, what about my book, you know? <laughs> and so how do you talk about Daniel Patrick Moynihan at your synagogue? So naturally, I came up with the topic of Moynihan and the Jews. Uh, and uh, it forced me to think through uh, what I had learned in doing uh, this book and how it really... Uh, how I observed Pat's relationship with with Jews uh, th through the letters. Uh, his relationship, at least, uh, it goes back to even his uh, time in uh, London when he was uh, working, uh, when he was studying at the London School of Economics. And you can see in the letters that um, he has a visit from uh, Theodore H. White, who then was a young correspondent for Time magazine. And he writes in his uh, diary that he met this young journalist named Teddy White, who he said is a, he said, a Boston Jew, he writes in his, you know, showing that Pat was aware of people's identities. Uh, 
And they have this conversation, and Pat is telling him about how, uh, and this is when he was in his 20s, he's been, always been very interested in the way I, the Irish integrated themselves into American society by going into politics. And um, Teddy White says to him, uh, you know, that'd be a good book you should do someday. And it was took 10 years uh, when he did that book with Nathan Glazer. Uh, and his relationship with Nathan Glazer was a real important uh, defining relationship for Pat's evolving attitude toward Jews. Uh, and uh, their discussions about cultural traits of the Jews versus the Irish, the drinking habits, the marital habits, the sexual habits. Uh, he, you know, uh, was fearless. He went everywhere in thinking these things through with the, the wonderful uh, and beloved friend Nat Glazer. Then he uh, later joins, after his uh, uh, difficulties during the 60s and the Kennedy and Johnson years, when he joins the Nixon White House, he begins really focusing on uh, what he feared was the self-destructive anti-war um, movement of, and, and the fact that the opposition to the war uh, was led by Jews. And you see that he told his friends who were Jewish, watch out, because if uh, Israel is in tr gets into trouble and you have beaten up on this Republican administration for, uh, uh, for its policies and its anti-communism, uh, there will be problems in turning to them for help for Israel. He's pretty blunt about that. And, of course, his fears come true in the 1973 war when Pat is stationed as ambassador in India. And um, his heart sinks as Israel uh, suddenly is uh, in danger of being overrun by its enemies. That war did not go well as first, as everybody in this room uh, probably remembers. But he uh, says to his friends a little bit of, I told you so. Uh, and then uh, skipping fast forward to his time in the United Nations when uh, I think almost incredibly it was in this period that Pat writes and says, uh, you know, I don't think I really understood the Holocaust until now, which is an amazing comment. Uh, but he sees uh, what, you know, the, the hatred in this resolution, and he understands something about Jews that I'm not sure he, you know, he wasn't sure he understood before. Uh, so it was an important moment for Pat Moynihan, and as Gil said, it's an important moment in U.S. history and in Jewish history and in U.S.-Israeli uh, relations. Uh, he, you know, there, it was said of um, John Foster Dulles, I think, that he was a bull who carried around his own china shop. <laughs> uh, there's a little bit of that with Pat. And I think there was a, uh, probably a legitimate concern at the State Department <coughs> and uh, in, among those around Henry Kissinger that uh, they had a lot of fish to fry and a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, on their agenda, and that this was a confrontation that was perhaps unnecessary. Historians are going to have to uh, consider that in new ways again and again. Uh, I think that's one of the imponderables of history. I often felt while doing the book on letters, on his letters, that I wished I could sit down with Pat and ask him what did he mean by this or what was he, did he have any second thoughts? Uh, uh, I have Maura to ask about that and I've asked her these kinds of questions. I've asked Liz uh, Moynihan these kinds of questions. And, I'll, and, and the one other question that remains in my mind is what was Pat thinking while he was doing this? I mean, he was a bull who 
if he didn't carry around his own china shop, could summon one up pretty easily. And he loved combat. He loved the fray. He loved he 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 loved the spectacle of politics, of being able to attack somebody and then shaking that person's hand and going for a drink uh, uh, later that day, which we all know in Washington is part of the tradition that the rest of the country may not understand and doesn't want to exist anymore. But um, he did, you know, Pat Moynihan not have in the back of his mind uh, engaging in this combat uh, at the United Nations that uh, it could pave the way for a political career for himself. I mean, I've asked Maura, I'll put you on the spot again. I've asked Liz, they don't think so, but they have never can't categorically say no. I mean, in the early 1960s, uh, after the Kennedy assassination, uh, Liz and Pat uh, decided to uh, buy their farm uh, in upstate New York and make that their per- permanent resident residence. I asked Liz once, do you think that Pat ever thought that his doing that would make it possible for him to have a political career in New York after all the places he lived? He always chose to have New York as his base. Uh, and Liz has said, I don't think so, but she couldn't rule it out. Nobody can rule out what's in the back of somebody else's mind. I think that uh, we all know, this, uh, the, the family knows the story about how after the Moynihan's moment, uh, the 1976 presidential race uh, got underway. Pat won as a delegate for Scoop Jackson, who ended up winning the New York primary. It was natural for him to be turned to by those who feared Bella Abzug you know, becoming senator from New York. Uh, and his, uh, he tortured himself a, a bit, but finally decided to run, and that really did change history. So I think, uh, th- I, wish, I wish Pat were still around because he would uh, give the most interesting, complex answers to all these questions. <laughs> and uh, I thank Gil Troy for producing a book that uh, answers many questions, tells a great story, and still leaves these tantalizing questions uh, in the air like uh, any great historian would. So again, Gil, congratulations, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Finally, it's a great pleasure to welcome Maura Moynihan back to the Wilson Center. Maura worked on all four of her father's campaigns beginning in 1976 and uh, was supportive of his work until his retirement from public service in the year 2000. From 2003 to 2008, she was director of the Friends of Moynihan Station. She also worked on the acclaimed 2004 exhibition, New York's Moynihan at the Museum of the City of New York. She's testified before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and made and written numerous articles and research papers on Tibet. In 1998, she created Radio Free Asia, the bureau in Kathmandu, Nepal, and she has served as a communications consultant at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and the Rubin Museum of Art in New York City. She has a bachelor's from Harvard University and a master's of political science from the New School. She's written two best-selling works of fiction, Yoga Hotel and Cover Girl. She's currently working as the executive producer of a documentary feature film about her father entitled Daniel Patrick Moynihan, American Visionary, which will be directed by the two-time Academy Award-winning documentarian Barbara Koppel. Mara. Thank you so much. And I want to thank the Wilson Center for hosting this wonderful event. And this place was so important to Dad. And he did spend his uh, final years here. And so it is always uh, very nostalgic for me to come back. Um, I see so many familiar faces. Um, anyone who knew Senator Moynihan or worked with him, can you put up your hand? Wow, that's wonderful. See, this Moynihan network, it just keeps going on and on. And I want to thank both Steves. And I want to thank Professor Troy, my friend Gil, for writing this remarkable book, which I, I highly recommend. You can't put it down. It really reads like a novel. And um, 
Of course, uh, I agree with you, Steve Hess, that uh, you know, Dad will be written about, there'll be more books. But after Gil gave this wonderful presentation at the Harvard Club of New York last month, my friend Danny Fisher, who's a film producer, came up and said, no, though this has to be a Hollywood movie. <laughs> Moynihan's moment, look at the casting. Pat Moynihan, Idi Amin, uh, Yasser Arafat, Jerry Ford, Henry Kissinger, and then there's, the, of course, the, all the FSOs and the people in the State Department. So if you have any ideas on casting, you can discuss it with us at, at the reception afterwards. Um, and I was just thinking what you said, uh, Steve Weizman, about whether Dad had it was considering running for office when he was the UN ambassador. And I would have to say, upon reflection, remembering those days, which I was doing for this presentation today, that he wasn't at all. It really, he thought his political career was over. Um, and when the attack on Israel surfaced in the United Nations, I really think it was dad's finest hour. And I think he was so consumed with what it meant, what it meant for the world and what it meant for the prospects for democracy. And he really was like, he was a man on fire at that time. I won one um, key feature of our time at the UN was the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, because the uh, UN representative has the 42nd floor of the Waldorf Towers. And across the hall from us was Imelda Marcos and Van Cliburn, the pianist who won the Tchaikovsky competition at the height of the Cold War. And Frank Sinatra also had an apartment there, and Paul Newman. So I just remember the elevator going up and down with all these people. And um, another feature of that time was a now defunct Irish bar called the Four Provinces which is a very smoky, dirty little place near the UN, where dad frequently used to go get tanked on Guinness uh, after a hard day at work at the UN with uh, the U Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, Chaim Herzog, another very important character, who was born and raised in Dublin and had a brogue and spoke like that, because his father was the chief cantor of Dublin and rabbi, and he never let us forget that. He was a marvelous man. So there was this Irish connection that, between the two of them, which was uh, very special. And um, I also think Gil was very, uh, Gil is right to remind us, to remind me, how alone they were at this time and how they stood alone. And so I felt the best thing I can do in my remarks today is to read Dad's very famous speech, part of it, from his book, A Dangerous Place. It's out of print, but I discovered you can get beat up old copies on Amazon.com for as little as a dollar. <laughs> um, and uh, in fact, I got this on Amazon. I thought I would donate it to the Lincoln, uh, Wilson Center. And I just thought I would read from this night what happened on November the 10th, 1975. The vote came on November 10th. The General Assembly was tense, not with uncertainty of the outcome, but rather with the knowledge of it. A succession of resolutions were adopted amending the decade for action to combat racism and racial discrimination. Most of the resolutions were aimed at Israel. The outcome was so predetermined that only two nations spoke in the formal de debate prior to the voting. Afterwards, Ambassador Herzog rose. Like Tiresias and Oedipus Rex, he began at a peak of intensity and sustained it through a superb text. It is symbolic that this debate, which may well prove to be a turning point in the fortunes of the United Nations, and a decisive factor as to the possible continued existence of this organization should take place on November the 10th. Tonight, 37 years ago, has gone down in history as Kristallnacht, the Night of the Crystals. This was the night on 10th November 1938 when Hitler's Nazi stormtroopers launched a coordinated attack on the Jewish community in Germany, burnt the synagogues in all its cities, and made bonfires in the street of the holy books and the scrolls of the holy law and the Bible. It was this night when many Jewish homes were attacked and heads of family were taken away never to return. It was this night that eventually led to the crematoria and the gas chambers, Auschwitz, Birkenau, Dachau, Buchenwald, Theresienstadt, and others. It was the night which led to the most terrifying Holocaust in the history of man. As he concluded, he tore the resolution in two. In 1935, in the Yeshurun Synagogue in Jerusalem, his father had torn into the British white paper announcing the limitation of Jewish immigration to Palestine. I spoke towards the end. It was our speech holy, Washington having had the sense to leave it to us and to leave us be. I rose and spoke. The United Nation rises to declare before the General Assembly of the United Nations and before the world that it does not acknowledge, it will not abide by, it will never acquiesce in this infamous act. 
As this day will live in infamy, it behooves those who sought to avert it to declare their thoughts so that historians will know that we fought here, that we were small in number, not this time, and while we lost, we fought with the full knowledge of what indeed would be lost. It is pre precisely a concern for civilization, for civilized values, or that should, those that should be precious to all mankind that arouses us at this moment with such special passion. What we have at stake here is not merely the honor and legitimacy of the state of Israel, although a challenge to the legitimacy of any member nation ought always to arouse the vigilance of all the members of the United Nations. For a yet more important matter is that issue. The terrible lie that has been told here today will have terrible consequences. Not only will people begin to say, indeed they've already begun to say, that the United Nations is a place where lies are told, far more serious, grave, and perhaps irreparable harm will be done to the cause of human rights. The harm will arise first because it will strip from racism the precise and abhorrent meeting, meaning that it is still precariously holds today. How will peoples of the world feel about racism and the need to struggle against it when they are told that it's an idea so broad to as include the Jewish National Liberation Movement? There is this danger, and then a final danger, that this most serious of all, which is the danger that we now do to the idea of human rights and the language of human rights, which could well be irreversible. The idea has not always existed in human affairs. This is an idea which appeared at a specific time in the world and under very special circumstances. It appeared when European philosophers of the 17th century began to argue that man was a being whose existence was independent from that of the state, that he need join a political community only if he did not lose by that association more than he gained. From this very specific political philosophy stemmed the idea of political rights, the claims that the individual could justly make against the state. It was because the individual was seen as separate from the state that he could make the legitimate demands upon it. But now most of the world does not hold with that philosophy. Most of the world believes in newer modes of political thought, in philosophies that do not accept the individual as distinct from and prior to the state, in philosophies that therefore do not provide any justification for the idea of human rights, and philosophies that have no words by which to explain their value. If we destroy the words that were given to us by past centuries, we will not have words to replace them, for philosophy today has no such words. But there are those of us who have not forsaken these older words, still so new to so much of the world, not forsaken them now, not here, not anywhere, not ever. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mara. Uh, now we have about 25 minutes for discussion and questions to the members of the panel. Let me say that we are being webcast live on this occasion. So if you have a question, uh, after I recognize you, please wait for the microphone to come. And if I don't identify you ahead of time, please state your name and any affiliation that you'd like to add. Who would like to lead off? Don Wolfensberger. Thank you. I'm Don Wolfensberger, a senior scholar here. Uh, first, an aside, a reference was made to Teddy White's relationship with uh, Moynihan. I seem to recall reading one of the Teddy White's first two books on the making of a president, and for the very first page, he is citing a brilliant young man at the Labor Department saying something that was brilliant, very brilliant, and prescient, as it turns out, and I just can't remember what it was about, but uh, I just thought that was kind of interesting. But uh, I would like to ask the author, and I thank you for the book, uh, a little context as to how Moynihan got to the UN, because it was kind of a surprise announcement. Uh, did Gerald Ford uh, override to Kissinger on this, uh, and I know the reaction among some circles was sort of surprise and uh, almost gratitude that here finally somebody's going to speak up at the UN because Moynihan was already known to be fairly outspoken, but uh, you know, I was just curious about that and then the decision to get rid of him. I mean, what, how, how would Ford and Kissinger go around on that one? <laughs> Thank you for those two questions. Uh, first of all, this was the third offer that Pat Moynihan had to work in the UN, the first two he had turned down uh, during the Nixon administration. And, um, and this time it's after his time in India. And he writes a, an article in commentary called The U.S. in Opposition. And this article is broadcast with great fanfare. It, it's, at a press con it's launched at a press conference. Uh, Norman Parthar had said he'd never uh, launched a, an issue with a press conference before. And the argument is, after two years in India, 
Moynihan is realizing that the world has changed, that the UN is emerging as the third world dictator's debating society. That's my phrase, not his. That the United States has to realize that this creation of its from the 1940s has now turned and the third world majority um, is changing. He also spends a lot of time, given that he was in India, focusing on British socialism and uh, the impact that British socialism had on third world leaders. And he says, we have to change our tactics. Kissinger, who indeed has a very complicated operatic relationship with Moynihan, reads it and uh, first of all cancels his appointment uh, that's upcoming so we can sit down and read the entire article and gives the academics highest praise. He says, I wish I had written that article. Um, and coming from Henry Kissinger in particular, that's a high praise indeed. So at that moment, Kissinger then talks to Ford and subsequently Kissinger would take credit and Ford would each, would each take credit for the decision to uh, invite Moynihan uh, to be UN ambassador. Now, there is a conversation that I found where um, Moynihan and or Kissinger and, and Ford do acknowledge that Moynihan had the tendency to be, and I'm quoting them, obnoxious. Uh, and so Kissinger is a little bit worried. Subsequently, Ford would take more credit for the decision. And, uh, and, and Kissinger, 5, 10, 15 years after the events, would feel that Moynihan set him up as a foil. And, if, and, set, and, and Kissinger resents that in a dangerous place, uh, he's set up as, as the bad guy. So that's, the, that's a little bit of the background. Uh, they understand that Moynihan coming into the UN is going to be much more confrontational. When Moynihan meets with Ford on the day that Moynihan's going to be uh, sworn in, he says to Ford, words do matter, words do count. And so they know they're kind of off to the races. Um, but there also is an interesting exchange that I found where Kissinger says to Moynihan, you know you're not Israel's representative to the UN. And he says, I know we have to show them that um, we, have, we have to show the Israelis and the American Jews that, that we're Americans. So there is a little bit of that tension that, that, that Steve sensed too. Uh, and there's also with Moynihan also, when he's in the room with the boss, he does have a tendency to butter up the boss and, and tell him what he wants to hear. So there, there, there's a little bit of that. Uh, Moynihan wasn't formally fired. And it's funny that Teddy White has come up twice. Now he'll come up a third time. Uh, but what happens is that subsequent to this great moment in November 10th, 1975, there are two or three moments where it looks like uh, Kissinger is going to succeed in getting Moynihan canned. There's actually even one moment where Liz Moynihan uh, comes with him to Washington for that press conference that's going to be the, the grand finale. And at the last minute, Ford convinces him not to, uh, not to resign because it was always a matter of resignation. Ford was much more supportive at this point of keeping on uh, Moynihan than Kissinger was. There's a great exchange during the Idi Amin tension, which is in October, where Ford looks at Moynihan and says, how you doing? And Moynihan looks at Ford without missing a beat and says, you tell me. I serve at the president's pleasure. Uh, but finally, in January, February, the leaks from Kissinger, especially a particular leak to James Reston in the New York Times becomes become so toxic that Teddy White says to him, you've lost, you've got to leave, and he does. Interesting, very interesting. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Bob Peck, and I'm a, my name is Bob Peck. I'm a former Moynihan staffer. Um, I, I'm wondering if, um, uh, Professor Troy, if you noted that um, Senator Moynihan, you know, sometimes could be a little quixotic about, uh, eccentric about policy issues, and I think at the time, and you noted it, that uh, defending the United Nations, everybody said, well, it's, so it's become a third world uh, uh, debating claptrap society, why, why bother? But it's interesting that he later, um, and I think with, with um, not so much more respect for it, returned to the issue in uh, the law of nations and a belief in international law. And um, so two things I wonder if you'd comment on. One is that, um, I wonder if you think that Senator Moynihan maybe had a sense that the Reagan era, uh, which in some ways you're praising, um, and the idea of exceptionalism took the United States into a position of believing it was not so subject to international law, and to what extent do you think Senator Moynihan um, might have been a bit concerned about that? And second, I wonder if you'd go back, the, uh, there's a point in your book about the fact that Moynihan saw the Zionism as racism resolution not just as an attack on Israel, um, but a Soviet um, founded uh, attack on America. Okay, I'll, I'll start with that. Thank you. Um, he, he, did, he called it the big red lie. And he sees the Zionism as racism resolution as part of a broader Soviet attempt, first of all, to squelch the three million Soviet Jews who are 
many of whom are talking about trying to immigrate. Um, and by declaring Zionism, uh, racism becomes a crime. And indeed, in Natan Sharansky's trial in the Soviet Union, they would refer to the Zionism as racism resolution. So there's that angle. The Soviets are also trying to uh, woo both the Arab world and the Africans. And so he sees this just as a, as, as a Soviet power play. He sees the entire uh, issue as a, a Cold War issue. Um, he says, indeed, that he had no particular ties to Israel. In fact, he complained that as an academic, as an academic he'd never gotten one of those fun free trips to Israel. And, uh, and he says, Israel's not my religion. You know, Nathan Glazer, Norman Put Harris, it was their obsession. It wasn't, it wasn't his. Uh, and, but he sees it very much as uh, an attack on democracy and decency. He sees the, the whole thing through this Cold War lens. And what's interesting is that not only is Henry Kissinger concerned with many other issues um, and not wanting to uh, make too big a deal about this uh, awful resolution, but even many people in the foreign ministry in Jerusalem are busy undermining Chaim Herzog, the Israeli ambassador, as he's uh, fighting uh, his own rear guard action because the Israeli foreign ministry is seeing Anwar Sadat and the Egyptians in the process of moving from the Soviet camp into the American camp. And their read is that this was a line in the sand drawn by the Libyans and the Palestinians and the Syrians in order to embarrass the Egyptians and prove that they're really still in, in the Arab world. And, uh, and that combined with the, an Israeli kind of arrogance at the time, there's no longer any Israeli arrogance, um, <laughs> where David Ben-Gurion had once said when he didn't like a UN resolution, uh, the UN in Hebrew is um. So he said, um shmum. It's nonsense. Uh, and, and that's where Moynihan and Herzog push back and say, words matter. Words count. Uh, in, in terms of the, the question of exceptionalism, uh, two dimensions to that. First of all, when the United Nations Association decided for the first time ever that a former UN ambassador, i.e. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, wouldn't be allowed to be its uh, honorary president after his tenure, he was quite insulted. He was quite hurt. And he said, they don't understand. I did this because I believe in the UN. I was fighting for the UN. I was fighting for its core ideals. And that, you know, it goes back to his dissertation, which was on the ILO, uh, the International Labor Organization, and his deep commitment to the rule of law, his understanding, along with so many Americans, uh, that the answer to World War II and the answer to the horrors of the Holocaust was to create uh, international structures, international institutions, and it's so much, uh, and, and, it, and it was so effective in creating infrastructure of the Cold War. So he really wants to, to, to preserve that. Now, of course, when Ronald Reagan comes in, some of Moynihan's best friends go in with the administration. Some of his former staffers work for the administration. Uh, the, the appointment of Gene Kirkpatrick is a, a compliment to Moynihan and definitely uh, you know, hiring somebody along the Moynihan model. But you're right, at the same time, he's a very harsh critic of Reagan's domestic policy. And even on the international front, he felt that Reagan was too much going it alone. So there's an ambivalence in, in his approach to uh, Reagan's foreign policy. But I, I think indeed, uh, and, and certainly in, in later years and during the George W. Bush years, um, Moynihan felt very strongly that it was important that the United States go back to those core ideals of the 1940s and 1950s, stand for human rights, stand for international law, stand for international structures. And he was quite disappointed and he warned uh, in the Law of Nations and elsewhere that uh, if, if the United States doesn't set that standard, then we'll have even more insanity. Let me take a moment to say a special word of thanks on behalf of the Woodrow Wilson Center to Robert Peck for, and in his role as Commissioner of Public Buildings, helping us get into this building in very good shape. Thank you. <laughs> well, it, it didn't necessarily leave love with your former agency, but <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Who's next? <clears throat> I'm sorry. Yeah, didn't see. Yeah. So, could you get this gentleman? My question is to Mr. Weissman. My name is. Uh, Bob Weinberg. I'm currently the honorary president of the American Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists, which several years ago put on a program at Fordham University on the Zionism is Racism resolution. But my question arises right out of your reference to the uh, Senator's Association with the London School of Economics. Almost 60 years ago, I had the privilege of serving as president of the Students' Union at the London School of Economics, and have been a concerned alum ever since. And as I recall, for many years, Senator Moynihan and Senator Tower were joint 
co-chairs or honorary co-chairs of the American alumni of the school, the American friends of the London School of Economics. And I wonder if you could comment a little further on uh, the senator's ties uh, to the school and perhaps his uh, association with Senator Tower in this joint enterprise. That's a good question, but I'm, I'm not uh, really that knowledgeable about it. Uh, his subsequent association with the London School. Maura, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, he was a very active uh, um, alumni member of American Friends of LSE. And um, of course, he loved England and always was going back to speak. And uh, we've always had British friends coming through the house. But uh, more than that, I don't know. I mean, my, my own feeling in reading his letters and diaries from that period was that it was utterly formative. I mean, I, I don't know what, uh, and Maura wouldn't either, uh, and, and neither would Liz, uh, what Daniel Patrick Moynihan sounded like before he <laughs> went to London in the early 1950s. But I would be willing to bet that he didn't, sound the same after that experience. Uh, his uh, mannerisms, his uh, taste in uh, uh, ties, you know, floppy bow ties, his uh, British uh, syntactic uh, tics, uh, I think were acquired there. And if you see, and you see in his uh, letters that he, ki he kind of fell in love with the Donish, uh, erudite, witty people that he met there and confessed, I really want to, I, I wish I, I could be like them. He, he says that in his diaries and letters, and he did. He, he, uh, he wanted, uh, as I put it, he wanted to become Daniel Patrick Moynihan uh, and uh, I think all of us uh, go through similar kinds of things. You, uh, uh, we pattern our interests and our lifestyles and our uh, even our mannerisms. I don't think it's that unusual, except that he was such a larger-than-life figure that um, you know that we can see that. And so I think his uh, his love of that period and how much it formed him. Uh, and and also he had a great time <laughs> in those years. He he did not, uh, shall we say, uh, confine himself to the libraries <laughs> of uh, of uh, the London School of Economics. He got out, and uh, so I, I wish I could tell you more uh, about his relationship with Senator Tower. Steve, you probably have some thoughts about that. Okay. All right. I do remember Bob Weinberg because it was over 60 years ago, in 1952, Chicago, the presidential conventions, and he was sleeping on my floor. Do you remember? <laughs> oh, I was, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so I was glad to see you. You look well. I came to hear you speak. <laughs> I remember the convention well. Question over here. In the back, by the wall. Uh, uh, ben Wattenberg, uh, AEI, and the Hudson Institute. This is not exactly a question, but it's a comment. Um, I was one of the two founders of the Coalition for a Democratic Majority, and Pat was very active in it. And uh, I happened to be traveling in China at the time when Pat beat Bella Absog in the primary. And I was with a bus full of people sort of a VIP mission, and I started screaming. I was so overwhelmed. <laughs> and I knew how much this mean. It was sort of taken for granted that if he would beat Jim Buckley in the general. And, uh, and, and I have a picture of, uh, of Pat. Pat and Scoop Jackson and Hubert Humphrey were the three honorary co-chairmen. And I have a picture of, uh, of Pat. Uh, and, and, and Tom Foley, uh, and Scoop, and Hubert, uh, and it's inscribed, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm writing away, and it's inscribed to Ben Wattenberg, who doesn't even listen to the speeches he wrote. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, and I look forward to your book, Gil. 
but thank you. Great to see you here, Ben. Yeah. It just inspires the, the, the crucial anecdote, <laughs> and it is indeed great to see you, Ben, um, the, from the 1976 campaign, which is that it was an incredibly close race, and most people assumed that Bella was going to win. Um, and in those days, a New York Times editorial really could sway thousands of votes. And at the very last minute, uh, John Oakes, who hated Pat and who was one of the people who was often uh, behind the New York Times editorials, which so distressed him, both in the UN and subsequently, um, went off, I think, to Martha's Vineyard for vacation because it was uh, September. And uh, Punch Sulzberger came in and uh, undermined his cousin and wrote the editorial endorsing Pat Moynihan for the Senate because he sensed that the winds were changing and that it was time for the New York Times to go a little bit more centrist. And that shifted the few thousand votes that uh, Moynihan got to win and, and ended up in the, 19, in the and, Senate. And right after the primary, um, Dad went to the Century Club in New York, which was his favorite club, and Punch was there. And in those days, that used to, if you had a Times subscription, you got an apron that said, I got my job through the New York Times. And my mother cut it up and made it a vest. So he went in and sat, <laughs> went to punch his table and said, I got my job through the New York Times. That's Which right. is, in fact, true. <laughs> and Steve worked for the Times, so you know the power of the Times. Well, that was a tumultuous moment in the uh, history of the New York Times. Uh, if you think about it, uh, for the CEO of an organization to fire his cousin uh, <laughs> takes some nerve. Uh, but the Times, uh, like New York City itself, was going through uh, terrible difficulties. And Punch uh, was trying to reinvent it. And it was in the mid-1970s that the Times inaugurated all of the feature sections that uh, were reviled by uh, many readers, but, re but which really saved uh, the times. And also, he was trying to bring it uh, to the center uh, politically. He felt it had gone off the deep end um, in response to uh, the war. It was these, as Gill so put it so well, these were the height of the culture wars, Nixon presidency was so divisive, Spiro Agnew, uh, and the race issue and the Lindsay administration uh, in New York was very polarizing racially. Uh, and the Times was caught up in that, the New York City teacher strike, which divided the uh, black and Jewish communities in New York. Uh, this was a period when I was in my 20s. I had just, uh, you know, starting out at the Times as a political reporter. And then on top of all that came the uh, financial crisis in which uh, in 75, as Gil said, uh, the city almost went bankrupt, uh, had to go in Chapter 11 almost. Uh, so uh, this was uh, part, part of the Times' effort to kind of find a new, uh, a new balance in that period uh, as, as a paper that would be sort of centrist. And I leave it, uh, I mean, we're, we're going through a, a similar period now of uh, polarization. I, I personally think the period we're going through now isn't as toxic or as uh, horrifying as I remember uh, the 70s being, but that's, that, uh, that's just a personal reflection. But uh, it's, it poses some of the same dilemmas for the kind of editorial voice that a paper like The Times has to have. There's another aspect of that that's sort of interesting. Could you um, use the mic, Steve? I'm sorry. No. Um, you, you, you see it in, um, in, in the Moynihan letters, n not possibly in all the letters uh, that Steve could use, but the whole panoply of letters, a constant... Um, correspondence self-generated by the, by Pat with Scotty Reston, with James Reston. Reston is the one he wanted on his side. Reston is the one he wanted to cultivate. Reston is the one he wanted uh, to make sure uh, that uh, uh, he knew what was, what was going on. Um, and uh, uh, anyone who has studied the, the Washington Press Corps, as I have, understood the powers of the Washington bureau at that time, and Reston uh, as the bureau chief. And so it is perfectly fitting, and the irony of it, got his job through the New York Times, 
and then Reston writes the column right. that Gill talks <laughs> about, that Don <laughs> mentions, and, uh, and he knows, uh, Teddy White says, it's all over. Reston has just written the column. And that's it, he resigns. Uh, a power that, that who, how many people can tell you who the bureau chief of the New York Times is today? Too bad, but I'll tell you if you want to know. He's a very, very good reporter. <laughs> well, I want to give Gil a couple of minutes here at the end to make any final comments, and then you can continue discussions with members of the panel at our reception following. First of all, I want to thank you and the Wilson Center for this uh, extraordinary event. I want to thank uh, my co-panelists uh, for taking time from your busy schedules and to actually read the book. <laughs> um, and, and respond has really been very moving. Um, and uh, I, I want to say that my wife and I have decided that we're going to donate a dollar for every book sold to some kind of fund that the Moynihan and Troy families will administer uh, to perpetuate Pat's men memory. So we hope that we'll sell a lot of books and we'll be able to do a lot of good with that, with that fund. And being a professor, I uh, can't leave without giving you some homework uh, in addition to a reading assignment and a buying assignment. Um, I walked by Pat Moynihan Plaza and walked by Pat Moynihan's boardroom to come into this Moynihan seance. Um, but I've discovered that in Jerusalem there is no Pat Moynihan place. And I want to launch a campaign to get, uh, uh, get, a, get a place or street named after Moynihan. Um, and apparently, uh, in order to do this, I already have the application on my desk. You have to get testimonials. So uh, my email is giltroy at gmail.com. And uh, I'd like to invite uh, any of you and all of you who feel uh, so to, to do so to uh, send me an email uh, just saying why you think that uh, Pat Moynihan should be memorialized in a plaza or street in Jerusalem. And I thank you all for coming. And uh, let's continue the conversation. Thank you. Long overdue. No, I'm going to beat you. I'm going to beat you. I'm going to get this named before Boynehan Station. That's the, that's the competitive street. Oh, my. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure. Yeah. It's like Sitting Bull's vision, the desert, and, um, when he comes and it